to turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26. I was a little different being up here. <laughs> uh, by the way, the stage should be finished. Uh, this is coming this coming week, and then we'll be able to add some more rows up in here. Uh, so that will give us a little bit more room. By the way, that's not the screen. That's not the final screen either. You can see the outline of the new screen that's going to be installed, and hopefully. Uh, the clicker will work a little bit better. Oh, there it goes. It's working today, so that's good. Um, I don't know what y'all think of when you think of communion. I mean, certainly this is very different than what you may have been used to when you were younger. Um, we started this, obviously, during COVID, and we um, Presbyterian, and I don't remember much about communion. Um, I'm sure we celebrated it. I think the only thing I can remember is sometimes we would celebrate it and they wouldn't let me participate. And I think when you're a kid, that always upsets you. But I don't remember hardly any of those communion services. Uh, when I got saved, I started going to a Baptist church. And again, I look back, I can't remember a single time. I'm sure we celebrate communion, I, I would assume, once a month. But as I think back, I can't remember any particular communion back then. And my guess is because they never really explained it, or I didn't understand what was going on, and it was just something we sort of did. I can remember when I first went to a Lutheran church, and they called us up to the front for communion, and I went up there, and I took the little glass of uh, what I was expecting to be Welch's grape juice, <laughs> and it was wine. I can remember, you know, I had never had wine before, and it sort of gave me a little kick, like, wow, this thing. I remember that communion because <laughs> I was like, whoa, something happened there. Um, and I'm sure if you have a Catholic background, you probably think, you know, you have the Mass and you have that whole transubstantiation and all of that. So as we think through communion, we bring a lot of different perspectives when it comes to communion. I think what's most important is to understand why do we celebrate communion? Why do we do this? Why do we do it? Uh, we do it here once a month. I uh, know some people do it more frequently. We try to find that balance between doing it frequently, but not so much that it just becomes part of the, of the routine. And so what is the history of this meal? Why do we celebrate communion? And that's what I want to look at today. It echoes back to the Passover. So when we're celebrating communion, we're actually tying ourselves to the Passover 3,500 years ago. And the Jews have celebrated Passover uh, consistently, probably, for 3,500 years. It's changed some, but even the Passover Seder that many Jews will celebrate today has many elements that can go back to 2,000, 2,500 years ago. So when we celebrate communion, we are connecting ourselves with Passover. We're connecting ourselves to the Jewish covenants. Uh, we're connecting ourselves to uh one another as believers, but we're also connecting ourselves to the generations of God's people over the last 3,500 years. That is the significance of communion. Uh, it started off as Passover, and then Passover was pointing to its fulfillment, and when we celebrate communion, we all understand the fulfillment of Passover, that the Lamb of God has been crucified for us. It's very appropriate that we reach, reach this part of Matthew on a Sunday that we're going to celebrate communion. And what I want to do is tie communion into the Passover feast that Jesus celebrated. They celebrated the Jewish people celebrating the Passover. So hopefully when you celebrate communion now and in the future, it uh, means a little bit more because you understand the connection, not maybe to your church background, but the connection to the Jewish Passover for 3,500 years. And so that's what we're going to look at today as we jump into Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be in verses 17 through 30. And before we begin, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer and just ask him to open our ears to hear, open our minds to understand, open our hearts to respond, and most of all that Christ will be magnified. If you will lift up holy hands in prayer, I just invite you to that Father, you truly are the King of the universe. You are the Sovereign. Father, every breath we have, every heartbeat is a gift from you. Right now, uh, in you, we live and move and have our very being. Father, it's amazing to think that when we celebrate communion, not only do we remember your death and your 
your son's death and his soon return, but we are connecting ourselves to redemption history 3,500 years ago. So, Father, open our eyes to understand the beauty of Passover. Help us to understand the beauty of the cross. Father, thank you that it's your blood that was shed for us that enables the judgment to pass over us because that judgment was borne by your son on the cross. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. And help us to understand that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's jump in. We are in Matthew 26. We're going to read, I'm going to read 17 um, through verse 19. This is the New King James Version. Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So we need to understand that the Passover was the first and the foremost feast that the Jews would celebrate. The Jews had seven feasts. 23, you can see those seven feasts uh, listed. Those seven feasts actually give us a sense of God's Christ's first coming and gives us a sense of his second coming, which we looked at with the Olivet Discourse. But four spring feasts, three fall feasts. Uh, they began in the first month, religious month of Nisan, and they went to the end of the year, but the seventh month was the month where the fall feast began, so you had that gap in there between them. But you had four feasts, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. Those first three were so interconnected that sometimes uh, we get confused. And so what I want to do is want to lay them out on a calendar. And so if you looked at your outline, I think I have them on there as well. The religious year, it's interesting, Rosh Hashanah begins sort of the civil year. That's uh, usually in September where they blow the trumpets. But the religious year for the Jews began in the month of Nisan. If you read back in Exodus 12, it says this shall be your first month. And so the Passover would have taken place on Nisan 14 or 15. And that's the day they would remember the blood being applied to the doorpost, which caused the judgment to pass over. And so it would remind them of their deliverance. I have a feeling that's not going to stay up there. Uh, it would remind them of their deliverance. Now this uh, began in many ways on the 10th of the sun, because on the 10th of the sun is when they would select the lamb. If you go back and I put Exodus 12 up here in your outline, you can see that they would select the lamb on the 10th day of the month, and then they would uh, kill the lamb on the 14th day of the month. What's interesting is Jesus' triumphal entry was on the 10th, and so on that day, and the Lamb is going to be crucified on the 14th and 15th. And so that whole time period was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread because before the Passover began, you would have to remove all the leaven from your house. They did not want any aspect of leaven in their house. Sometimes Passover and leavened bread, sometimes it was called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which included Passover. Sometimes it was just called Passover, which included that whole eight, eight days. But the point is, those were so interconnected. Oftentimes, when you have here in Matthew 26, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that is the beginning of the Passover season, which would have been the uh, Nisan. First fruits was the Sabbath, the day after the Sabbath of Passover week. And so on that day, first fruits fell on, falls on a Sunday, and that's when Jesus Christ was resurrected. It was the first fruits. That's when they would bring the first fruits of the grain and dedicate it to the Lord for a fruitful spring harvest. So that's the connection. So you see Jesus entered on selection of the Lamb Day. He celebrated Passover, crucified, associated with that Passover sacrifice, rose again on first fruits. And that whole time period is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Fifty days after the final part of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is Pentecost, and that's when the church began. Did you catch all that? The big question that sometimes people have is, is this meal that Jesus celebrated, was it a Passover meal? If you read John, the implication is that when Jesus died, he died at the same time that the lambs were being slaughtered. And it says that the 
Jewish religious leaders did not want to go into Pilate's palace because they did not want to defile themselves because they had not eaten the Passover yet. Meanwhile, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it sure sounds like what Jesus celebrated with his disciples was the Passover. So that creates a big <coughs> theological debate. Is John correct or Matthew, Mark, and Luke correct? Did they celebrate Passover early? How do you reconcile these two things? Some people see it as a discrepancy. Harold Honer, I take his view in um, his chronological aspects of the life of Christ, and he notes that there is good historical evidence that the Galileans and the Jews, the Judeans, had a very different way of understanding when the day began. The Galileans started their day actually with sunrise, sort of like what we do, and so their Nissan, I keep wanting to say, I don't know if it's Nissan or Nissan, when I think of Nissan, I start thinking of a car, so i got to say Nissan. They calculated that the day began at 6 a.m. and ended at 6 a.m. You have some evidence that the Galileans looked at the day a little bit differently. The Judeans saw the day beginning at 6 p.m. like traditional Jews do today. So they would have understood the calendar a little bit differently. And some people say, well, how would they allow that to happen? Well, because as Passover grew, uh, Josephus said sometimes they slaughtered up to 200,000 lambs. <laughs> and if you could imagine, and they have like a two-hour span to do that. I mean, it's a certain time. And so I think Josephus' implication is they allowed it to go over two days because that enabled them to slaughter all those lambs. So the Galileans would come into town, and they would celebrate communion on the Psalm 14. And so when they celebrated Passover, because Jesus' disciples are Galileans. It is on that appropriate day to celebrate Passover. Meanwhile, the Judeans, those that lived in Jerusalem, they calculate Nisan 14 beginning at 6 p.m. and ending the next night uh, at 6 p.m. And so they would celebrate Passover between that time of 3 to 5, or slaughter the lambs between 3 and 5 o'clock on that next day. So assuming that is true, which makes a lot of sense to me, Jesus both celebrated the Passover and was killed at the very moment that the Passover lambs were being slain in the temple courts, which shows you the incredible way that God put those two things together. Either way, I believe what Jesus celebrated was the Passover meal. And so you see that preparation. Who were the ones that came to Jesus saying, where do you want us to prepare? It was the disciples. So you see the anticipation. The disciples, this is a huge event. They looked forward to Passover. It was a meal of meals in many ways. And so they were excited about the Passover. There is some conjecture that some of the disciples may have thought maybe Passover would be the time that Jesus finally shows that he is the Messiah and eliminates them from the bondage of the Romans. Because every time they celebrated Passover, it was a celebration of freedom, freedom from bondage. And so there are some people that think Judas, part of what his motivation may have been was to stir up Jesus to finally act and do something, because Passover was that time. But regardless of what, you understand the disciples had a great anticipation to celebrate Passover with Jesus. And so you also see Jesus' arrangement. It's interesting, it's sort of a clandestine, sort of a covert action where he says, go into the city and a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. People wonder why is he keeping it sort of secret. Luke says he only sent Peter and John to do all, all of this. And so probably the best guess on why he did it in secret, John Walford has as good of a theory as anyone. He says the plan is to keep the place completely secret from Judas and the rest of the disciples except Peter and John was necessary to avoid premature arrest and interference with the events of the evening. And many people believe where they celebrated Passover was probably John Mark's house. You see John Mark's house, Mark being the author of the Gospel of Mark. You see in the book of Acts that John Mark's house was used many times. It was a larger house. They had servants. And also John Mark sort of appears in the Garden of Gethsemane Gospel of Mark is the one who they grab his blanket and he runs away um, basically in his short sight. That's not what else to say. And they think that John Mark was with him and it must have been because he had seen them celebrate Passover and went with them to the Garden of Gethsemane. 
Again, all of that just shows Jesus' arrangement. This was an important time as they celebrated Passover. So now let's keep reading verse 20. Now when evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Surely I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Then he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. So now we get to the Passover meal itself. And thankfully, we do have a picture uh, that someone took of the Passover meal. And so we know exactly what it looked like. Um, they all sat on the same side of the table, and um, you know, they had a nice spread there. That's not what the Passover meal looked look like. Leonardo da Vinci, certainly that's a famous painting, but it's probably nowhere close to what a Passover meal looked like. They generally look more like this. A U-shaped table, and probably about 18 inches off the floor, so that everyone could have like pillows, and you could recline. It's an interesting way to eat. I don't know if you've ever been, there's a place in Israel where you can actually go to a, a Roman place where you can sort of eat that way, which is very strange. You're sort of laying on these couches, but it was a sign of freedom. If you could recline while you were eating, it was a sign that you were a free person, and it was a meal, very special meal. And so they're all reclining in this U-shaped, uh, U-shaped table, as they were reclining, they were eating, and the food would usually be put in the middle of that view. And this would be a family meal, which is interesting that Jesus is celebrating with his disciples. And you don't get the impression, there may have been some others there, but the only people you hear about are the disciples. So what Jesus is communicating is this is his family, which is what he has said in Matthew 12. And one reason I know that Passover is a family meal is because Luke says, oh, um, that's a little bit of an impact on that. This is the way they would start off the Passover meal, uh, was this blessing. And if you do a Jewish Savior, this is how you begin it. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing to say together. So are you ready to say this? This is how they would begin. This is the blessing of the Passover meal. Are you ready? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. And you, O Lord, our God, have given us festival days for joy. And this Passover feast at the remembrance of our deliverance. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and enabled us to enjoy this season. And what a great blessing to remind ourselves that He's the King of the universe. Uh, it's a time for joy as we remember what Christ has done, and we thank God that He's sustained us. And it's a remembrance of our deliverance. And so even in the Passover meal, it's a remembrance of deliverance. We just understand it as a deliverance from much more than bondage in Egypt, but bondage to sin and to death. How do I know it was a family meal? Because Luke tells us there was a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. You read this, and this is at the end of his ministry, and Luke says... Still, they are arguing over who is the greatest. And his concern is over who has the place of honor. If that's true, and I think part of us, we think, How, why, what are these guys so dense for? Why do they continue to do that? But then you have to stop and think, if this is really a picture of us, do we gather together at times where our focus is to be totally on the Lord? And do we ever have some elements of pride in how we relate to one another? And upset that someone maybe ignored us, or upset that focus is not on us, or someone left us out, or someone's not talking to us, or someone who likes this person better. This is human nature. And I'm so glad that the disciples included this because it reminds us that even here at this most sacred time, this time that Jesus is celebrating his disciples, they are still trying to figure out who's the greatest. And I don't know how they're doing this. I don't know if it's based on how many demons they cast out how many miracles they did, or who Jesus talked to the most, or who he liked the most, but for whatever reason, they're arguing. That's what prompted Jesus to get down on his knees and do what? Begin to wash their feet, saying, the greatest of you are those who are willing to be a servant. 
That's significant because I think probably what they're arguing about is where different people sit because that would convey honor. We don't know exactly how they were sitting, but we get the impression from the Gospel of John that John was right next to Jesus, uh, Jesus being right there in the center. We also can almost conjecture that the place that Judas was sitting was right there. Judas would have had probably a place of honor, which continues to show that Christ, even at the last, not only did he wash his feet, but probably gave him a position that would have considered a position of honor. I think it was uh, uh, Michael Green who said that if Jesus were able to whisper in the ear of Judas, then Judas must have been reclining next to him in one of the two most favorite positions. Jesus did everything to show his love for Judas, but in vain. And how do we get that? Well, if you look, it says... Jesus announces, one of you will betray me. They're all sorrowful. They all begin to say, Lord, is it I? Then he answered, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes as written, but woe that man to whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who betrayed him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, you have said it. The implication is that no one else is hearing this. Uh, no one else is hearing him ask, and Jesus basically saying, you said it. And in John's gospel, it's a little bit more clear where he says, the, when John asks, he hands the bread at that moment to Judas. The assumption is all of this is taking place where the disciples don't see it and don't hear some of this conversation. But the point of the betrayal it goes back to Psalm 41. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. I don't know what your biggest wound is or what your biggest hurt is, but I would say that betrayal is the biggest wound that any human being sustains. If someone who is a friend, the very one that stabs you in the back, that is a wound that is horrendous, and it's a wound that's very difficult to overcome. And I'm sure some not all of us have had some aspect of betrayal. And so Jesus experienced a betrayal with someone who he sat at a place of honor and who the other disciples had no idea that he was the one who had done it. That tells me that Judas, he did all the miracles the other disciples did. He cast out demons like the other disciples did. He looked like a true disciple, but we find out that his heart was not submissive to the Lord, which is a warning to us all. He says, Rabbi, is it I? You notice the difference in verse 22. The other disciples say, Lord, is it I? Judas says what? Rabbi, is it I? And I do believe that is significant. If you look through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, doesn't your rabbi pay the temple tax? Uh, we want to see a miracle from you, Rabbi. Uh, rabbi, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? And so all of those sort of say they have a view that Jesus is important, but they do not see him as Lord. And when Judas betrays Jesus, immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And so there are many people that love Jesus or, or say they love Jesus and see him as a great moral teacher, but if you do not see him as Lord, you have an insufficient view of who Jesus Christ truly is. He is Lord of all. Let's keep reading. Verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it. Oh, by the way, we believe Judas left at this point. You see that over in the Gospel of John. So Judas left before this Passover meal, or before this institution of the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So now we have this Passover meal. And if you were at a Passover meal, typically you would have four cups, or four cups would be um, drunk at that significant Passover feast because it represents the four four statements that we're going to look at in Exodus chapter 6. You would have the lamb, and you would have the matzah, the bread. And the matzah is uh, an unleavened bread that we partake of because that's what Jesus, that's what God said to do on Passover night. It's really the bread of affliction. 
It's a bread for slaves in many ways. It's a bread that can be made quickly. And it does not have any yeast or any leaven to make it rise. So it's more like a cracker. But more, many people have noticed that the typical way they make matzah, it is pierced, which is very interesting, and usually it is striped. And so there seems to be some interesting parallels in the fact that Jesus not only was pierced, but also his, by his stripes we are healed. But here's what Jesus says, and it's important, don't go over it too quickly. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Now, I don't want to get into the whole transubstantiation, consubstantiation, that kind of debate, because to me, human language is very clear, and if I were to hold this up and say, this is my body, I think all of you would understand I'm using an illustration. <laughs> this represents my body. Uh, this is a picture. Just like when sometimes I put my stick figures up here and I say, this is me. None of you start thinking, wow, how did you do that? He's up on the screen, you know, running around. No. Jesus, just like he does many times, says this is a representation of his body. And he takes something that they would have celebrated as Jews every Passover, and he gives it a new meaning. He took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke the bread, and he gave it to the disciples. So if this matzah, this bread, represents his body, think through those four actions. I think those actions are important because we're going to see them elsewhere. In Matthew 14, when Jesus feeds the 5,000, notice the same words. He took the five loaves and the two fish. Look at the heaven. He blessed and broke and gave. Same four. Then when he fed the 4,000, he took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks very similar to the word blessed, broke them and gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitude. So those four words are very important. And I believe that the bread represents his body. What did Jesus, what is he saying? He's saying that he took on human flesh. That same word take is going to be used in Philippians 2, where it says he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. Same word. It's also going to be used in Isaiah 53, which is quoted in Matthew 8, where it says he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. So Jesus took upon himself human flesh, then he blessed that human flesh, then that human flesh was broken for us and then given to us, offered to us freely. I think the taken shows that he's the son of man, he took on human flesh. The blessed shows you that he is the son of God. He is the one who sanctified uh, human flesh and showed its value, and that's why we're going to be resurrected, because he sanctified us, uh, the human flesh and humanity. It was broken. He was the servant who was broken for us, and he is the Savior. And so that bread, when he says, take, eat, this is my body, what he's saying is, just like this matzah, which is striped and pierced, I took on human flesh, I blessed that human flesh, and then I offered my body as a sacrifice, and now I'm offering it to you. And what is to be our response? We are to receive it, and that's sort of the implication. The bread is offered, the bread of life is offered, but I have to choose to receive it. And eating is really a good picture of faith. If you know anything about me, I'm a picky eater, and I don't exercise a lot of faith when it comes to food. I examine it pretty closely. There's a lot of food I refuse to eat. But to take the bread is a way of saying, I receive what Jesus Christ has given, and I take it to myself to the point of eating it, to receiving it to the core of who I am. And all of that is symbolic of what Christ has done. And when he was broken for us, and during the meal they break it, it's a picture of his sacrificial death that you see in Isaiah 53, that he was broken for us. And so that's the significance of the bread. What's interesting is that none of the Gospels, what's missing from this Passover table up here? There, there had to be a lamb there. In fact, Luke's Gospel implies that Peter and John went to have a lamb uh, slaughtered for the Passover meal, but none of the Gospels ever mentioned them eating the lamb and never mentioned the lamb. Why is that? Because I think the gospel writers want all the focus to be on the true lamb, uh, 
Uh, that's what Paul says. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new uh, unleavened batch as indeed you are for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. And so it's just interesting that all the Gospels want to put the emphasis on the bread and the wine. But they don't mention the lamb because Jesus Christ is the lamb. Well, let's go to the cups. Oh, and by the way, that's if you look at the Passover, they would spread blood on the doorpost and on the lintel of the house. And if you think about it, boy, that sure looks like uh, that would be the cross. And so all of Passover was pointing to the fulfillment of Passover when the Lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. Not only with the matzah, not only with the lamb, but also with these four cups. And so at a Passover meal, they would have four cups that would be consumed during the time of the meal. And it was based off of Exodus chapter 6. There are four things that God says he's going to do in Exodus 6. He says, I will bring you out of Egypt. I will rescue you from that bondage. I will redeem you, and I will take you as mine. Different names I've seen in different saviors, but the one I use is sanctification is the first cup. Judgment is the second cup. Redemption is the third cup. Praise is the fourth cup. First two cups take place before the meal. The second two cups take place after the meal. And so Jesus and his disciples would have drank that first cup, the cup of sanctification. They would have uh, drank the second one. And then they would have the meal. And then you're going to find out in uh, Matthew, or particularly in Luke, it's going to say after supper, he is going to take, it says after supper, he took the cup. And which cup is that? It is the cup of redemption. That word redeem is an important word. It's the word uh, goel or gael. It's the word that used for a kinsman redeemer. The only way uh, you could be redeemed in that culture from slavery was if a kinsman redeemer, someone who was part of your family, was strong enough and wealthy enough to take upon your debt upon himself and then release you. And that's what Jesus Christ did. And so that cup represents his redemption, and it's tied to, in this case, to the new covenant. What do we know about the new covenant? Jeremiah 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. Who was this covenant made with, by the way? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Does that mean that we, the church, have replaced them? Absolutely not. The true fulfillment, the final fulfillment of the new covenant is going to be when Israel receives their Messiah. So how do we get grafted into this new covenant? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 11, we have been grafted into the covenants of Israel. That is what's so amazing about God's grace. Us wild Gentiles have been grafted into this new covenant, and we participate. But the fullness is coming when the Jewish nation itself receives their Messiah. It's a covenant which they broke, and that's important. The reason we need a new covenant is because no one can keep the old covenant. When they instituted the old covenant, this is back in Exodus 24, Moses took the book of the covenant, read it to the people, and they responded... We will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. How well did the people of Israel do in keeping everything the Lord had said? Not very well. How well do we do in keeping everything the Lord has said that we will obey? None of us meet that standard, and that's why we needed the new covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. Aren't those awesome words? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you make a mistake and you beat yourself over and over or if you feel like you fail a lot or if you have shame from the past or guilt from the past that still 
you have the memories and it's so hard to escape from, but do you realize because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, as God sees you, He sees you, if you've trusted in Him, He sees you with the beauty and the righteousness of His Son. He will forgive their iniquity and He will remember it no more. He will cast it as far as the east is from the west. How can God do that? How can God, who is holy, who is a holy, righteous judge, how can he forgive us our iniquity and our sin and remember it no more? Because Jesus took this cup and drank it, drank it to the full. If you do a Passover Seder, you'll remember this cup because this is the one you dip and you, you remember the ten plagues of Egypt. And all those plagues are a picture of God's judgment and his wrath. You want to know the cup in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus asked God to let it pass from him? It was the cup of judgment. Jesus bore all of our sin upon himself on the cross. Every sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Everything that has violated God's law, both in thought and action and motive, was laid upon Jesus Christ on the cross. And we're going to see that in a few weeks when he shouts out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He has become, not just bore our sin, but he has become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. So he can be, he can, we can celebrate the cup of redemption because Jesus drank the cup of judgment. And then what does he say at the very end? I love this. He says, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The last one is the cup of praise. And apparently, if I'm reading this correctly, Jesus did not drink that cup. He just left it there. Um, I don't know if the other disciples drank it or not. But basically he said, I will not drink this final cup until the day I drink it with you in the kingdom. Because with that fourth cup is the promise that I will be your God and you will be my people. And so that's why when we celebrate communion, we remember the redemption because Jesus bore our judgment and we look forward to the day when we celebrate communion. We can celebrate the Lord's Supper at the marriage feast of the Lamb. When he has become our God, he is our God, and we are his people in perfect holiness. And so that's the meaning of communion. It points back to the Passover and what Jesus Christ has done for us. At the end of that night, it says in Burry, they sang a hymn, probably from Psalm 118. So think about what they sang that night before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and be glad in it. And the last thing they sang before they headed out, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. And what they were about to see was the greatest display of love that Jesus Christ would lay down his life. God demonstrates, proves his love for us, and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. And because of that, when we celebrate communion, what should we do? Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. So will you take that communion cup, and uh, as we celebrate, hopefully that gives you a, a greater sense of the meaning of communion. It points back to the Passover Actually, I think one of the best things you can ever do when you celebrate communion, and obviously uh, it's very hard to do, but if you can put it around a meal, that's such a beautiful thing because Passover is a meal. And in fact, I would challenge you uh, as Easter comes up, if, you, if your small group or your family or a group of friends want to get together and do something like a Passover meal, uh, I have called a Haggadah, that's more of a Christian-based one, and I would be more than happy to share with you how you could lead your family or your small group in doing a Passover-type meal that is just infused with all of what Christ has done for us. 
So if you're interested in that, let me know. I didn't say Hagen Das, I said Hagen Da, which is very different. So I'm not offering you Hagen Das, I'm offering you Hagen Das. But anyway, so here's what Paul says I received from the Lord, that which I delivered you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is a symbol that is to point us back to the true sacrifice. This is not a sacrifice. This is a picture of the one and only sacrifice that was done for you on the cross. It was totally sufficient. That's why he said it is finished. And that's why he sat down at the right hand of God. Because his work is complete. The first thing we should do before we partake of the bread is to give thanks. So what are you thankful for this morning? God's love. Amen. Christ's death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. It's hard to take this cup of agony. Amen. He takes that cup of agony, which we're going to see uh, next week. His mercy and grace. His mercy and his grace. Is sufficiency. Some people have asked me, should we be serious and sober during a time of communion, or should we be celebratory and joyful? Paul does say we should take this seriously, because what we're remembering is the most important thing we could ever remember, what Christ did for us. And so to take it flippantly, or in that case back then, they were celebrating a meal, and some of them were getting drunk and not waiting for each other. Yes, God takes it so seriously. If you take it flippantly, then Yes, there is a reason to examine yourself, but something's obviously wrong with your heart. But if you are, if you understand what Christ has done for you, and you're thankful for his grace, this is to be a time of celebration. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And this is to remind you of a love that was given to you, which is a love you can never fathom. I do say this is a family meal. A meeting, just like Passover was a family meal, if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior, I encourage you to trust in Him. Because it's not what you've done, it's what He has done for you. So before we take, let me pray. Father, thank you for your grace, and thank you for your love. Father, we give you praise for what you've done for us on the cross. We celebrate together because you are good. And we thank you for forgiveness in Christ. Father, we thank you that someone here is not know Jesus, may they trust in you, and may they participate in a way that shows they understand what it means to trust in you alone for salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name.